Hi, everybody. This is another episode of Hashing Out the Law. This is season three. I'm very excited for this episode. I have with me Thomas Mesereau. Everybody knows who Tom is, so I'm going to skip the introduction. Hi, Tom. How are you? Thank you for coming on. Morning, Arash. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored and uh, I appreciate it so much. The honor is mine. Thank you. So, Tom, let's just dive right in. Um, I'm not going to talk about your background. Everybody knows. Plus, in the introduction and in the comments of, of this episode, everybody can read about who you are. Um, you've represented um, many different celebrities, such as uh, Robert Blake, Mike Tyson, Michael Jackson, Bill Cosby. Um, but you didn't start as a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, what made you want to be a criminal defense lawyer? Well, first of all, I was very lucky. I had a father who was not a lawyer, but always advised me to consider law school. And he always said to me that if you don't know what you want to do in life, law school provides you many options to try many different things. And he was 100% correct. I went to law school and I was looking for a good job, wasn't quite sure where my talents were uh, or what I would like or not like. So I began a searching process. And again, my father's advice rang true. Law school allowed me to try different areas of law, different types of jobs, and I tried a bunch. My first job out of law school was with a big civil litigation firm in Washington, DC. And I was in the public utility section where the lawyers I worked with were representing public utilities and energy related companies. And I was putting together rate hearings, which are trials in front of administrative law judges. And the experience was very valuable. I learned what big firms are all about. I learned how the lawyers function, how they think, how they prepare pleadings and strategy, et cetera. But I knew it wasn't for me and I wanted to get back to California. So I made a radical change. I joined the Orange County District Attorney's Office south of Los Angeles. And it didn't take me very long to know that I was a fish out of water. I didn't like prosecution. I didn't like jumping on unfortunate people with problems that weren't necessarily of their own doing. And I remember my first job was, uh, first case was to prosecute a young girl uh, for shoplifting. And she'd been caught at a, a grocery store or a department store, I don't remember. And she admitted what she had done. She was on tape. There were eyewitnesses. It was a case nobody could lose. I mean, you know, you could be half asleep and you'd win this thing. And uh, I wanted to find a way to get her some treatment because ironically, when I entered the office, I went through a training program. And part of the training program was to do a tour of the juvenile facility in Orange County. And as part of the tour, I was shown a iron door with a small glass window and the glass window looked into a suicide room where people who are considered suicidal were being watched. And there was a little girl sitting all alone, uh, nobody with her, her head in her hands on her lap. And it turned out that was the first one I was asked to prosecute. And I looked at her file and she'd been, the, she'd been an orphan. She'd been the victim of sexual abuse, drug use, uh, all sorts of abuse. One of the first things she looked for when they arrested her was typewriter fluid to sniff because she was addicted to that, which we know is very damaging to the brain and the bodily organs. And it was so sad, so pathetic, I didn't want to prosecute her. And I was told I had to. So we went to trial in front of a judge and she was convicted. I went back upstairs to my office and everybody wanted to high five me and congratulate me for getting a conviction. And I was utterly disgusted. Um, I wanted to find a better solution to help this poor soul with treatment, with direction, with counseling, with emotional support, and I could not do that. So that was my introduction to being a prosecutor and didn't take me long to realize it wasn't for me. And then I decided to, after about a year, to leave the office. I wanted to live in San Francisco where I'd gone to law school and loved, loved the Bay Area and still do moved to San Francisco and no sooner did I move into an apartment, I didn't have a job, but I'd been offered some jobs in law school. Uh, I got a call from my father who was president of the Orange County West Point Society. 
My father was a West Point graduate. And he said that one of the members of the society was a vice president with a Getty Oil Company subsidiary called Getty Synthetic Fuels. And the president was looking for an assistant and the president wanted to meet me. So I flew down and met him. He offered me the job. And for almost three years, I was assistant to the president of a large oil company subsidiary. And I was kind of a troubleshooter. I was supervising lawyers and law firms. I was running around the country trying to put out fires, you know, whether they were political, administrative, legal, whatever they were. It was a fascinating uh, expose for me into corporate life because I dealt with every department, legal, marketing, finance, you name it, and attended all kinds of meetings where, you know, I would observe how people interacted at the corporate level. And then after about three years, decided that my future wasn't there. I joined a small law firm that was civil. I began bringing some criminal cases in. I was trying civil cases, legal malpractice, plaintiffs and defense, entertainment, business. And I began to bring in criminal cases on my own um, and did some pro bono work in the criminal area. And I realized this was the area I want. But again, going back to what my father said to me about law school, we, uh, we have more options to try things, to experiment, to reinvent ourselves than any other degree I can think of. And I've known lawyers who were joined big law firms. They wanted the big firm experience. They were let go during an economic collapse like 2008. They were horrified, didn't know what to do. And a year later, they're on their own and they've never been happier. They're happy that this, what they thought was a catastrophe, pushed them in a direction that was better for them. So we are lucky to be lawyers. We are lucky to have gone to law school and we're lucky to have the options we have. The big problem is a lot of lawyers are not creative or imaginative and they wanna stay in their area because they feel more secure with it even if they don't particularly like it. When I started getting some publicity because of my high profile cases, there were some articles saying he had switched from civil litigation to criminal defense, which was correct. And I was getting calls some lawyers saying, how do you do it? I want to do it, you know, but very few will do it because they're just too afraid to jump into a strange area. And I would tell them, you learn it like you learn any other area in life. You run down to state criminal courts, you run down to federal criminal courts, you sit there and you watch what's going on. You talk to public defenders, you talk to private lawyers about why they did what they did. You start reading book after book about criminal defense. You get, you know, in those days it was videotapes and audio tapes. I used to buy them like by the dozen and I would listen to them and listen to them again and, and think about them and listen to them again. And, you know, this was all a process of education, trying to find out how this whole world works. And if you want to do it, you can do it. And a law degree lets you do it. Right. I guess I gave you a longer answer than you wanted, but, uh, but anyway. Right. It was actually a great answer. It was, it was a great answer, which brings uh, a lot of other questions to mind for me. One of them is when you started working um, as the assistant to the president for the, for the Getty Oil Company, um, you weren't really in, in court and doing litigation and stuff. Did you miss that? Did you miss that, that thrill you get when you're in the courtroom? Well, I, I actually was a little bit because I was supervising what lawyers do around the country. And I began to be very much disliked by a lot of law firms in New York, Chicago, Southern California, because I, the president would ask me to look at a case and read the file, talk to the lawyers involved, and then give him an opinion of what I thought the case needed. And I was able to do that because of my, you know, legal abilities and being a member of the bar. So I would do that. And I remember telling him that there was a problem in New York City with the Department of Sanitation because the company was building a plant on Staten Island, a synth synthetic fuels plant, and they couldn't get permits. So they were in litigation with the Department of Sanitation. So I got the file, took a look at it, talked to the lawyers involved, said to the president, do you mind if I just call the representative of the Department of Sanitation, say I'm the assistant of the president, we're in this litigation, is there a reason, is there a way we can just sit down and talk about it? So he said, by all means do it. 
and I didn't tell legal counsel about it. And I called this person up, I flew to New York, we settled the case in an evening. And the law firm was very upset with me for intervening and not telling them and as you would expect. Well, turned out we were having a similar problem outside of Chicago, couldn't get permits, we're suing the Environmental Protection Agency of Illinois over the withholding of permits. I called their representative who was a civil engineer said, can I fly to Chicago? Can we sit down and talk about the case? And he said, sure. And he said, I'd love to do it. Settle the case in an evening. The law firm in Chicago handling it went berserk. Uh, then the same thing happened in California. Um, so uh, I was learning about litigation. I was supervising litigation. I wasn't going into court per se, although there were a couple of times I was in court just to watch what was going on. But I was following what happens with litigation and following how big law firms particularly handle corporate clients and it was quite enlightening. And I'm assuming all of that experience and knowledge that you gained doing that came, comes in handy when you are in, in the criminal field and, and working up a case and going into court and, and trying it. Well, I like to think whatever we do in life, there's something to learn from it from our successes and our failures, from our high moments and our low moments, from the times we look good to the times we're embarrassed. I think there's something to learn from everything. And if you take that approach to life, whatever you do and try will not be a waste of time. It will be a positive development in your growth as a lawyer and as a person. So I certainly took from this a knowledge of corporate America, a knowledge of what happens inside corporate America with different departments, how they interact, uh, how they work with each other, whether it's marketing, legal, finance, you name it, engineering. Uh, I certainly learned a lot about how lawyers present themselves to clients and what lawyers really do. And I'm not gonna say that it was directly relevant to criminal defense, but it taught me a lot about people, a lot about human nature, a lot about companies, a lot about lawyers and none of this has been a waste of time at all. That's, a, that, that's actually very true. That's very true. Every day is a learning experience. Um, let me ask you this. Every lawyer, well, let me change the question up a little bit. When you were Orange County District Attorney Prosecutor, you gave us an example where they gave you a case and you had no choice because you worked for an organization and they, if they give you a case, you have to take that case on. As a private uh, uh, attorney on your own, uh, we have the ability to choose what cases we take and what cases we don't take. Um, and every attorney in their career has taken a case that later on they regret it. They, they actually agreed to take this case on. Is there such a case in your career that you, that you have and want to talk about? Well, if there is, I wouldn't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> let, let, me, let me start with some generalities. Uh, I think as criminal defense lawyers, we are very lucky people. I think we make the system work more than anybody because we're up against it all the time. The odds are usually against us. We're not particularly well liked by society. Historically, criminal defense lawyers have not been well liked. And a lot of people just don't understand what we do. And they don't understand that our job is not just to fight for our clients in court, it's also to make a system work. A system which I think is the best system in the world, but nevertheless is filled with problems, filled with injustice, filled with mistakes, filled with unfairness. And we make this system rise to the greatest heights it can by challenging the prosecution's case, by taking the constitutional rights that our clients have, no matter what they've done or haven't done, or no matter what they're perceived to have done or perceived to have not done, and making sure that they have the rights that everybody else has. Making sure that because somebody accuses them of something, they're not treated in a devalued way. Or making sure that because they come from an economically deprived area or a racial or ethnic or religious group that's being despised or being attacked, we wanna make sure they are not mistreated. And I, I keep using the word devalue because human beings have a conscious and unconscious need, in my opinion, to devalue somebody that they compare themselves with. In other words, I don't mean to sound cynical, but I think it's human nature to try and think you're better than somebody in some area. 
children on the schoolyard, ethnic groups within ethnic groups, religious groups within religious groups, you name it, national groups within national groups. People want to see if they can be better than somebody else. And that's human nature, in my opinion. The great thing about human beings is we can rise above it. We can recognize what it is. We can say, you know, you know, I was taught to do this, it was wrong, or my inclination was to do this, it was wrong. I'm gonna rise above these basic human instincts and we're gonna, we're gonna treat everybody with value, with dignity, with equality, no matter who they are or what they're accused of doing. We make that system work to its best level and we're not always liked. So being a criminal defense lawyer has challenges, but the satisfactions to me are great if you believe what I just said. And I know what I said is correct. Uh, have I taken cases I wish I hadn't taken? Yes, we have difficult clients. We have clients that uh, don't treat us well. Uh, sometimes I tell students when I'm lecturing, I said, here's, here's what happens when you're a criminal defense lawyer and I'm generalizing and I'm being over overly simplistic. If you win, nobody needs you anymore and nobody wants to be reminded of that difficult problem they had that you had to solve. If you lose, you're a devil. So, you know, get ready for some rough moments, get ready to develop some thick skin, but remember you're doing a great service to our country by taking cases that nobody else wants. I've always thought the highest ethical duty of a criminal lawyer was to defend the, the, the despised, the hated, the vilified. Um, that's the greatest calling for a criminal lawyer because that's how the system works to its best level. That's actually the, the a eloquent and beautiful answer. People ask me all the time, how do you do what you do? How do you defend these people that they say they are guilty and you know they're guilty? And um, I'm gonna refer them to your answer and to, to, so they understand why we do the things we do. Well, people don't like criminal defense attorneys until they need one or, or, or until their loved one needs one. And then their, their whole attitude changes. They realize the system they took for granted as being fair may not always be as fair. And it can't be totally fair because it's comprised of human beings who lack perfection. You know, no human being is perfect. No organization of human beings is perfect. We're all human, we make mistakes in various forms. Organizations make mistakes in various forms and no system of justice can be perfect. So we're always striving for a higher level of fairness and justice and, and never completely solving the problem. I mean, think about it. You look at the history of our country and our criminal laws are always changing. They're always evolving. We've got new courts of appeal, new Supreme Court judges, we've got new politicians. And you see rulings coming out that change what was there previously. Well, if we had ever reached a sense of perfection, you wouldn't have to change anything. You wouldn't have to revise laws. You wouldn't have to reconsider what we've been doing for decades, but we have to because the system just isn't perfect and everybody's got to do their job to make it work the best. The judge has to do his or her job, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, the witnesses, the jurors, the bailiffs, everybody has to do their job with passion and with integrity and with ethics for this system to work the best. That's completely true, which leads to my next question. Um, you mentioned that we have changes in the system. We get new judges, new politicians. Uh, recently in LA County, we, we got a new, um, a district attorney elected. He used to be the district attorney in San Francisco up north where you're from. And he's brought with himself a lot of controversy. He's, he's trying to um, uh, reform the system. And some people don't agree with his direction. Um, do you have an opinion or would you like to make a statement about what you think he's doing or if-, if Well, I, I, I haven't met him personally. I certainly know a lot about him. And you know his tenure just began and he just became the district attorney. He's someone who clearly cares a lot about what he does, which is why he's trying to change certain facets of the system that he thinks need change. I mean, if he were, if he were just a hack who wanted to be safe and please everybody, he wouldn't walk in with an agenda like he apparently has walked in with. And my 
perception of him at the moment is he doesn't take anything for granted. He just because the law is on the books doesn't mean he accepts it as the best way to be. And he clearly cares enough to, and, and is courageous enough to try and institute some changes. And that kind of person has to be commended for taking a fresh, creative and courageous approach to what they do. I'm not saying I may like everything he's talked about doing. I'm not saying I may dislike things he's talked about doing. It's really a new process and I haven't met the man, but anyone who approaches their job with ingenuity and creativity and a desire for positive change is someone who I have to commend in certain areas. That's a good answer. We just, I, I think it's a wait and see with him and, and let's see what happens. He is getting a lot of pushback from his own people and, and from people from the other side, but he's also getting a lot of support. So it's a wait and see, in my opinion. Um, let's change directions a little bit. Now let's go back uh, to you. You're a criminal defense attorney. You started bringing these things, uh, these criminal cases in, and, and now you're just focusing just on criminal defense. What was your first breakthrough case, in your opinion, or, or a case that you, you changed the direction of your career? Well, I was doing a lot of criminal defense work uh, in both state and federal court at one stage of my career. Um, I was donating a lot of my time to free legal clinics throughout Los Angeles. I was attending First African Methodist Episcopal Church, First AME Church, uh, which was led by Pastor Cecil Murray, one of the greatest pastors in American history. And they had a free clinic that met on Sundays and I was a regular uh, attendee of that clinic. I also was devoting time to other clinics in Los Angeles. There was a group called Save Our Sons, a group at uh, uh, a another church in South LA. It was a group formed by mothers whose sons were inc incarcerated. And these mothers were all African American and they all felt their sons had been mistreated, had been unfairly mistreated by the system. So the leader of the group was a woman who had been the first African American female graduate of the University of Louisville Medical School. She was a medical doctor and her son was doing what looked like a life sentence at the time. And she's very, very brilliant, very in, 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 ingenious in how she assembles people and attacks problems. So I met her and used to speak to her group about the drug laws, about other changes, about the Supreme Court. They had various clinics uh, where they would educate people on the law. They had a prison ministry where busloads of people would go to prisons to talk to prisoners and help them with spiritual development, et cetera. They had job clinics where people who had, were convicted felons needed direction on how to get a job. They would go to the job clinic. They would get companies that would actually hire people with criminal records, which many companies did not. So I helped the Save Our Sons organization a lot. There were clinics at other churches throughout South Los Angeles that I was also donating my time. There was a group called Families to Amend California Three Strikes Law, which called FACTS, which was composed of people who were fed up with the Three Strikes Law and the, the absolute injustice of the way this thing, particularly at the beginning, was being imposed. So there would, there would be weekly meetings of the group called FACTS that I would attend. There were marches and demonstrations and things of that sort that I would hear about through my clinics that I would participate in. And at one point I, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to see things for myself. In fact, when I entered law school, I was really torn because I thought of being a journalist rather than being a lawyer. And I had this fantasy of going into hot spots myself, seeing and feeling things myself coming to my own conclusions myself, um, and that that would be a way of life for me. And in some ways, being a criminal offense lawyer is like a journalist. I think we owe it to ourselves and our clients to, yes, get all the information we can from others uh, on all sides of the table, but check things out ourselves. And I, I was doing this work uh, I started going into the deep south doing death penalty cases free. Uh, that's a whole other story I can talk about. 
Uh, but one day at the first AME Church legal clinic, a volunteer lawyer asked me if I would like to interview with actor Robert Blake, who was in the highest profile murder case in America, and he was switching lawyers. So this lawyer was a transactional lawyer who donated his time twice a month to the clinic, very wonderful guy, nice person, great lawyer. And I said, yes. So I said, uh, I, I arranged to meet with Robert Blake at LA County Jail, not knowing if he was interested in really, after he heard about my background or not, because my background and my, the cases I was taking and the things I was doing were not really entertainment related. And nor was I trying to be a big Hollywood guy. I was doing a lot of gang defense uh, for little or no money. Uh, one gang murder case after another, to tell you the truth. You know, LA was a slaughterhouse of gang violence in those days. Uh, every night on various corners throughout South LA, drive-by shootings were just killing young men. And it was just uh, the advent of crack cocaine had decentralized the narcotics business. And because of that, you know, there was a decentralization. Very, it wasn't a few people controlling everything anymore. And you know, drug dealers were shooting each other, shooting each other all the time. And the gangs were just uh, running roughshod. Um, and I began defending those cases and I would try to find a way to do something different from other defense attorneys. And the first thing I learned was you have to be a human being. You have to be sensitive. You have to care. You have to go into the neighborhood and find out who your client is, how they were raised, who raised them. Where do they go to school? What good things have they done? What tragedies have they experienced? What led them into gang life? And learn about the gang culture and try and bring humanity into the courtroom, try and humanize your client in a system that thoroughly dehumanizes an alleged gang member from the day the case is filed. So at any rate, this was the kind of stuff I was doing, not Hollywood cases. I had certainly represented a couple of actors, a couple of Hollywood types, but I wasn't that kind of a, that was not my persona. I wasn't associated with a firm that seemed to specialize in the problems of celebrities, but Blake seemed to like what he heard. So he hired me and one thing led to another. Uh, that's actually uh, a great story, which leads to my uh, next question. You talked about your volunteer time in the deep South. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was reading books uh, about the death penalty and how it uh, allegedly was imposed in the South. And most of the books I read said pretty negative things. And I was interested in finding a way to try a case in the Deep South and come to my own conclusions. And I mentioned to a few friends that I would love to try a case in the Deep South. Um, one friend talked to a woman who is now the professor of the death penalty clinic at Berkeley School of Law at Cal Berkeley. Liz Semmel is her name. Liz Semmel at the time was a California lawyer who had moved to Washington, D.C. to run the American Bar Association's death penalty representation project. And she was trying to find lawyers and law firms to get involved in post-conviction appeals and habeas petitions were people who were sitting on death row in various states. And I ended up talking to her on the phone and I said, you know, I really don't want to do post-conviction. That's not my specialty. I like to try cases. And she was kind of dumbfounded that I would want to go down south and put my reputation on the line trying a death penalty case because as you well know, if your client gets death, for the next 10, 20 years, your reputation is going to be savage. Everybody's going to be saying in state court and federal court that you were incompetent, that you gave an inadequate defense. There may be published opinions attacking your reputation. And I said, I don't care. I want to try cases. This is what I do. And I'm not going to be discouraged from it. So she was at a seminar on the death penalty where she met two white guys from Birmingham two lawyers who had been assigned a very high profile death penalty case in Birmingham, Alabama. One of them was Charles Salvaggio, the other one was Wilson Myers. And they were getting death threats on their office machines and there were a lot of racial issues. 
a homeless black man was charged with shooting to death a beautiful white girl in a trendy part of town. And it was just stirring up a lot of emotion in Birmingham. And they called me, or actually, actually she called me and said, if I'm interested, would I give them a ring? And I called them. And they said they'd love to speak to me. So I paid my way to Birmingham, Alabama, paid my hotel, met these guys, and instantly knew they were great lawyers and great people. And we developed a, uh, a friendship that has gone on for over 23 years. Now, unfortunately, very recently, my dear friend Charles Salvaggio passed away at the age of 66. It was unexpected, it was sudden, it was shocking, and I'm still reeling from this. Wilson Myers is still practicing in Birmingham. I spoke to him the other day, but I've been trying capital murder and murder cases in the Deep South for 22 years. We met about 23 years ago, and uh, I wouldn't give up these experiences or anything. I've never earned a dime never earned a penny doing any of this. I've always funded it myself and um, wouldn't give up the experience for anything. It's really had a lot to do with my development, not just as a lawyer, but as a human being. Seeing things for myself, realizing you know reality is much more complex than people try to make it. And quite honestly, even though the steep South is received as having some problems when it comes to the death penalty, I've had some jurors and then juries in the Deep South that were much more fair than Los Angeles. Um, I've had some excellent judges. I've had some excellent, fair, balanced prosecutors. So, you know, reality is always more complex when you get close to it and become part of it than it is at a distance. We tend to simplify everything at a distance because there's nothing else we can do. Right. But I wanted the experience myself and I got it. Let me ask you this. In the, in the 20 plus years that you've been doing this, uh, do you think that the system down deep south has evolved and changed? I think it's evolved and changed. I mean, I've noticed in Alabama, fewer death penalty cases being pursued, um, which is good. Uh, you know, funding is always a problem. You know, I mean, death penalty cases are very expensive. You know, the defense has to have a number of experts, including experts on one's social history to humanize someone if one ends up in a penalty phase. Um, investigations got to be completed. Not everybody has the money to do it. I did a pro bono death penalty case in Mississippi years ago. And I got a call from a young guy as part of a small civil rights group in Mississippi and he told me that he knew a lawyer who had been assigned a high profile death penalty case uh, in Mississippi. And the lawyer assigned the case, basically made a living on court appointments. His whole practice was court appointments. Um, the presiding judge had asked him to defend this death penalty case. And he'd never tried a felony case in his life. He did DUIs, he did divorces. And he asked around for help, called some of the best known lawyers in the community. And when they heard it was a death penalty case, they said, no, we don't want that type of case. And, he, and basically I got the call and I flew down on my own dime to Mississippi, um, rented a car, got a hotel room, uh, met this young guy, drove through the Delta to Parchman, the famous penitentiary, met the client. Client was a young former gang member charged with murder in a drug, allegedly, you know, in a, in a drug deal. And supposedly it confessed to the FBI, it confessed to the local police. And I noticed that he'd been in and out of some mental institutions. So I immediately agreed to take the case. I wanted the records from these mental institutions. There was a battle with the judge over what they would cost. And I realized that a lot of communities, a lot of counties, a lot of states don't have the funding available to give one the kind of defense that one should have in any capital case. And it made me realize that not all of this was due to malevolence, it was due to funding problems and nobody had a real solution to them. And I also realized that defendants facing the death penalty in California were getting pretty good treatment by comparing with other localities. But the point I'm making is 
I don't think it was necessarily intentional that funding be so limited in a capital case as people didn't have the money. Now, there were problems with judges. The trial judge in the Mississippi case I just mentioned thought that one day would be more than enough time for a guilt phase and a penalty phase. Wow. In other words, uh, to anyone listening who doesn't know that how death penalty cases are handled, you know, there's the guilt phase where the jury determines whether your client is guilty of the crime and if the, of a capital crime, excuse me, um, if they find your client guilty of a capital crime, you then go into a second phase where the jury is going to decide whether your client's going to get the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole. And that's the way most states work in this area. So it's really two trials in one. When I heard the judge thought one day would be enough for both, I, did, I shook my head. Well, we eventually resolved the case on the eve of trial and he got the mental health help he needed and a possibility of parole. So it was a victory for us in a case that everybody thought was impossible and nobody wanted. Um, but uh, getting back to my point, I'm the kind of person who likes to see things for myself likes to judge things for myself. That's why I thought of being not only a journalist, I thought of being a foreign correspondent. You know, my dream at one point was to just sort of fly into hot spots around the world and just soak things up myself, question people myself, see what works, see, see what reality truly is. And uh, I think being a criminal defense lawyer involves a lot of that. I agree with you. I, I always thought about being a detective and I think being a criminal defense attorney offers us the opportunity to be sort of like detectives. Yes. I, I have a, a, a question for you. So now you, you and when I say now, you, you represented Robert Blake. You're beginning to begin more of these Hollywood cases. Eventually, uh, Michael Jackson is accused. Uh, he starts with Mark Garagos, and then he switches to you. Um, the trial starts. And to everybody's surprise, you don't want any cameras in the trial because you think it's going to be unfair. Tell us why you made that decision um, and talk about the trial a little bit. I mean, you, I know you've been asked so many questions about this. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, first of all, I think the question of cameras in the courtroom is a case specific issue. In other words, I don't approach these cases with the idea that I don't want cameras, period. I approach cases with the idea that, you know, uh, every case is different. Now, in the Robert Blake case, I was there for the preliminary hearing, which lasted three weeks. And I was asked by the court staff uh, on behalf of the judge, did I want cameras? And I said, yes. And... I had a strategy in the Blake case, which was that I was going to turn a preliminary hearing, uh, which everyone expected to be about three days into three weeks of a trial. <clears throat> and what I was going to do was I, I really sensed hubris on the part of these prosecutors. They seemed to be feeling no pain. They seemed to think that they had this thing in the bag. And I was new to the case. Uh, and I think they thought I couldn't be prepared to do a serious cross-examination, even if I wanted to. And I did prepare and I turned it into a mini trial and their witnesses were not prepared for cross. As we both know as criminal lawyers, the criminal lawyer rarely does much cross in a prelim. One, because we're not always ready for it. It's early in the case. And two, because we don't want to give away our cross-examination, which will happen at trial. Uh, and, you know, we're just not, we're just not usually very prepared. Well, well, I prepared morning, noon and night and went into the courtroom and all of this was on court TV at the time. Uh, and I started really whacking these witnesses hard and made a record uh, that I think was very instrumental to his acquittal at trial because the prosecution put on their most important witnesses at the prelim, eyewitnesses to his allegedly trying to solicit a hitman, uh, all their forensic people testified. Uh, they had other people testify. And 
They just weren't prepared for cross, in my opinion, and they weren't good witnesses. So the cameras in the courtroom really helped us because going into that preliminary hearing, Court TV had some surveys done. And going into it, the vast 80 plus percent of Americans thought he was guilty. Uh, coming out of the prelim three weeks later, 80 plus percent of viewers, American viewers, thought he was not guilty. So I think it had a lot to do with changing public opinion about Blake. I think it had a lot to do with exposing weaknesses in the prosecution's case and locking witnesses into statements and testimony that they ended up living to regret. Uh, two very good prosecutors were replaced by one I don't think was as strong as they were because there was some embarrassment that, that the prosecution's case looked as bad as it did. And I got Blake Bale in a capital case. You know, as you know, in California, if you're charged with murder with special circumstances, which is a capital case, meaning you can face either death or life without parole, there's supposed to be no bail. Well, Blake was charged with murder with special circumstances. They said he was lying in wait. Uh, and that was one, one factor for the shooting. Um, and he was repeatedly denied bail. Well, I got him bail at the end of the preliminary hearing. It was 1.5 million with an ankle bracelet. So that's a situation where I said, put cameras in, they're gonna help us. In Jackson, uh, my feeling was this was already looking like a circus. And I didn't want the trial judge to think that I was showing up in town, uh, a Hollywood hotshot trying to just get a lot of publicity. I felt the judge would work with us a little more fairly and be a little more flexible with us if he didn't think I was looking for press for myself. And I also didn't want witnesses seeing what other witnesses said. You know, even though witnesses are instructed, don't read the papers, don't watch television, don't watch news reports on the case, you wonder if they really listen to that. And this case had so much publicity associated with it. Uh, I was afraid that witnesses would watch what other witnesses were saying before they came to testify, and I just didn't want that. And by the way, as an example of the kind of publicity the Jackson case had, on verdict day, there was a special report on NBC, breaking news, the jury has reached a verdict in the Michael Jackson case. And this was Brian Williams on NBC, a well-known newscaster. And he said, just to give you a perspective on how big this case is, he said, there are over 2,200 accredited media from around the world covering the trial. That's more than OJ Simpson and Scott Peterson combined. So that's how big that one was around the globe. Now you asked me about the case. It was very unique. It was very exhausting. It lasted five months. Uh, I moved up to Northern Santa Barbara County in the town of Santa Maria, which is north of the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, I lived like a hermit. I had a duplex. My staff and co-counsel had duplexes near me in a gated community. Uh, I went to bed at 7.30, latest 8 o'clock every night. I was up at 3 o'clock without fail every morning. My staff were up all night updating witness books. They had a key to my condo, so they would be opening the door every hour of the evening, bringing an updated witness books to put on my stairwell. And I didn't want to be seen in any bar, restaurant, hotel at night. I didn't want people filming me or trying to put me in a compromised position. And uh, that's how I lived in this high profile environment. It sounds pretty bleak, but fortunately it was effective, it worked. I wanted to be fresh as I could be with plenty of sleep each day. I operate best between the hours of three and 6.30 in the morning. I really just, when you're fresh with a pot of coffee, you just ingest this material, you know, I, I ingest it better at that, those hours. And that's how I lived. I lived like a hermit. I mean, people probably looked at this thing on TV and said, he must be, you know, really popular and seeing all sorts of things going on. I was, I was focused on the case. And I took over 90 witnesses during that trial. I was exhausted. When I finally moved back to Los Angeles uh, and realized I was back and survived it, I didn't want to get out of bed for weeks. I was just drained, <laughs> completely drained. I mean, 
In a high profile case, you know, you have more opponents. You have the prosecution, who was your main opponent, uh, but you also end up with people trying to stab you in the back on your side, trying to take your place, trying to criticize you publicly, trying to insert themselves into the case. And it's a very stressful experience, particularly if someone is sensitive about what they're doing and cares about their client, which I did. I, I still think he's one of the nicest human beings I ever met. I don't think he was guilty at all of any of this. And uh, I think he got a very bad you know, shake the way this thing worked out. I mean, yes, he was acquitted, but I don't think he ever recovered from it. And he, he moved out of the country and he unfortunately died very early, but really one of the nicest, most sensitive, one of the kindest people I've ever met. And I, I'll say that till the day I die. I don't think he was guilty of any of this. I think it was these charges were trumped up and it was really sad to watch him go through all of this, but he was such a target because he was the most famous person in the globe. Right. Yeah. Um, most people don't realize how much work goes into a trial, especially a trial uh, such as that one, which I don't think anybody but you has ever experienced something like that. Um, when I was younger and I first started, uh, I worked for Anthony Brooklier and he would get up every day uh, around the same time, like three, four o'clock every day. And he was in the office Sundays and people don't realize how hard it is to actually uh, be a criminal defense attorney who actually works and, and cares about their clients. Now, Tom, I know you're short on, on, on time and I don't, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, is there anything coming up or any, any projects or cases that are, that are coming up that you're excited about and you want to talk about? Well, you know, I, I am defending Danny Masterson in a case in Los Angeles. Uh, a very nice human being, wonderful person um, who has been falsely accused. There's no question about it. And I'm very honored to defend him, honored to speak for him. Uh, I don't want to say much more about the facts of the case because it's in progress and I don't want to do that. But I, and I've been avoiding the media completely on that case. But uh, uh, he's not guilty of this. These charges are bogus. And I look forward to exposing the truth when we finally get to trial in that case. Um, other cases, look, we're always defending a multitude of cases, some big, some small. I do white collar and non-white collar. I have some white collar cases that I'm dealing with at the moment, but I just wanna emphasize how blessed I am to be a criminal defense lawyer and how lucky I think we are to have the profession we have. We can be loners, we can be misfits, we can be rebels and we fit right into criminal defense. Uh, we fight the system, we fight odds, we're not afraid to go against popular opinion, and we, we serve a very vital function, as I said earlier, we make this system work for everybody because power does corrupt, and prosecutors have enormous power, police have enormous power, sheriffs have enormous power, FBI agents have enormous power, and sometimes if they get away with things they shouldn't be doing, they'll do it again, or they'll make it even worse. And sometimes power corrupts in ways that are subconscious. You don't even realize it's making you think you can do things you shouldn't be doing. And when we expose an abuse of power, when we expose people breaking the rules who shouldn't, uh, we make everybody else more free and safe. And making this system work is a great privilege and a great honor, and I'm very honored to be a criminal defense lawyer. Those are those are words that I agree with, and and I, I think you said it so eloquently. Last but not least, let's talk about the Mesro Free Legal Clinic. It's a clinic that you have in Los Angeles that gives pro bono uh, legal aid to to the community. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it hasn't been uh, happening, but. Um, we're gonna we're gonna put uh, links to to the Mesro Free Legal Clinic uh, in all the descriptions so people can actually access it. Tell us a little bit about the Mesro Free Legal Clinic and uh, why it was so important to you to have this clinic. Well, as I said before, for years and years, I donated my time to various free legal clinics, various civil rights organizations throughout Los Angeles. And after the Michael Jackson acquittal, you know, my name was pretty big at the time. So I said to myself, this is the time to start our own clinic. And 
got together with many dedicated people. Sophia Harris has been with us from day one. You have been a godsend to the clinic. Uh, Arash, you, you speak about the drug laws, you speak about criminal law, you've done so much to educate the community that needs help, and we really commend you for what you've done and what you continue to do as a criminal defense lawyer. Um, we basically meet twice a month, uh, typically a Saturday. Uh, anyone can come who feels they want someone to talk to. It can be any kind of legal problem, civil or criminal. We have people who donate their time and have specialties in many different areas. And sometimes we can individually take your case and other times it's a matter of just giving some direction. But people in the community need someone to talk to. Many have been the victim of bad lawyering. Many are being taken advantage of by sophisticated businesses and companies and individuals who think they can get away with it because they're dealing with low income people. And we do everything we can to provide counseling and direction and help to those who most need it. Uh, we serve underserved communities. We have job fairs where we advertise who we are and what we'll do. Uh, we do expungement clinics to help people shed convictions uh, and any, everything related to that, certificates of rehabilitation. Um, we have guest speakers, judges, lawyers like Arash uh, who come to share their knowledge to help other people with their problems. And uh, I always like to say that nobody's a loser, everybody's a winner. The lawyers who donate their time come out winners because they've helped their community and they've honored their profession. The people who need help are winners because they find someone to talk to no matter what the problem is. The churches where we typically have our clinics benefit they like showcasing their concern for the community. There are no losers in this, in this type of system. And uh, more lawyers should donate their time because they'll find that they enjoy their profession much more when they're giving back as opposed to just making a living. Very true. Thank you for your very kind words and, and thank you for being on, uh, on Hashing Out the Law. I really appreciate it, Tom. It was a pleasure. Um, I could go on for hours picking your mind, but I know you're a very busy man and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank Tom. you, Rush. Been very honored to do this and uh, thank you for choosing me. My pleasure. <laughs>